Hello, we're going to be in Luke chapter 3 today, which really deals with the ministry of John the Baptist as the forerunner for the Messiah. This goes back to several passages in Malachi chapter 3 and I believe it's 3, 1 and 4, 5 that really uh, show us what the Jews were expecting uh, before the Messiah came. They were expected a reincarnated Elijah to prepare the way for the Messiah. Well, John the Baptist fulfilled that role. And the way we see it so important is because of the detailed John uh, that is going to be connected with John by Luke. Now, probably it's also to show the time when Jesus began his public ministry. We do a few months after John, but it's an extensive dating pattern in these first few verses. Let's look at them together. It'll take us a while to go through this now, so follow with me, please. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, now, there's been a lot of ambiguity and fighting over this, and this is the reason. We know that, that uh, Tiberius took over the control of the provinces two years before Augustus died. Now, do we date it from when he took over the provinces or from his coronation year? Now, the other problem is this. There is a Roman way of dating time, which goes from the date you were coronated, and there's a Syrian way of Rome reckoning time, a more Eastern way, which only starts after the first full year. And so we, the closest we can get, I think, is 27 to 29, probably 27, is the date we're talking about in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius. Now, he reigned from 14, when he was coronated, to 37 A.D. Now here's the second one. When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. Well, if you remember the gospel story, Archelaus took over from Herod the Great in Judea. But Archelaus was removed by the Roman authorities in A.D. 6 because he changed his name to king and he was replaced by by these, seri of, these series of Roman administrators, okay? And uh, Pontius Pilate uh, was from 26 to 37, A.D. 26 to 37. Now, here's the next one. And Herod was governor of Galilee. Now, this is Herod Antipas who is going to behead John because of Herodias, and we're going to talk about that in this chapter. Now, he reigned from 4 B.C., that's when Herod the Great died, to 39 A.D., long reign of Herod Antipas in the north in Galilee. Okay, now here's the next one. And his brother Philip was governor of the territories of Utrea and... <laughs> now, Philip was really the husband of Herodotus. And that's, that's why it was such an incestuous thing to the Jews. He, Philip reigned from uh, 4 B.C. to 34 A.D., another child of Herod the Great, okay? And then we have one more. Lysanus was governor of Abilene. Now, Luke's been criticized for this because this same man we found is a bit later, uh, a man by this name, was governor of this area. But for a long time, there was no records of, of it at the, that would fit this time. But the more the uh, spades of the archaeologists have dug up the ancient Near East, the more the historicity of the Bible, and in particularly the historicity of Luke, has been confirmed. We have now found records that this man, this country is just north of Galilee, we have found records that this man was the uh, governor of this area at this period right here, probably around 27 um, A.D., okay? Now in verse 2 it says, in the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas. Now, the reason it says the high priest singular and then lists two men, the high priesthood was meant to be for life, and a man's children would take over, Aaron and his children. But when the Romans took over, they began to sell this office. It was a political plum because there was a lot of revenue developed from selling the animals and changing the money. Remember what Jesus cleansed the temple for? Well, the high priest owned all of that exchange of animals and money. It's a very lucrative thing. Now, Ananias reigned or, as for his high priest from A.D. 6 to 15. Now, he was deposed by the Romans, but several of his children succeeded him, and he was really the power behind the throne. Now, Caiaphas was the reigning high priest from A.D. 18 to 36. We know that Annas was the uh, power behind the throne because Jesus was taken to see him. John 18, 13, Acts 4, 6 shows some of this. Okay? Now, the message of God came to John. This is the Old Testament formula 
to show the prophetic nature of the message. Remember, John is not the first New Testament preacher. He's the last Old Testament prophet. The message that he proclaimed was not a gospel message, but it was a preparatory message for the life of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now, notice where it mentions them, uh, the son of Zechariah in the desert. Now, many of us believe that John has been influenced by the Essene community. Now, you may know them as the Dead Sea community. That's where the Dead Sea Scrolls came from. And possibly that's where he got some of his training. There is some affinity between the gospel preached by John and the belief of this desert tribes. Uh, now, notice where he was a Nazarite, by the way, also. He sure dressed funny, wore camel skin and ate locusts. You would not have liked to invite John the Baptist to your Sunday dinner. I assure you for that. Now, notice in verse 3. And he went all over the Jordan Valley. Why Jordan Valley? Well, he had to be close to water. He's a Baptist. <laughs> he had to have water. Uh, preaching a baptism. Now, was baptism something new for the Jews? Well, yes and no. There is a proselyte baptism within Judaism. And they would baptize converts that were Gentiles. The, the converts baptized themselves and ha had to recite the Shema, which is Deuteronomy 6, uh, 5 and 6. Okay? That's there. The Essenes practiced baptism. Maybe John was influenced by them. And, and finally, washing or ablutions are a symbol of cleansing. We get that idea from uh, Isaiah 1:16. So maybe there was a background of cleansing. Now here it says, a baptism conditioned on repentance to obtain the forgiveness of sins. Now the word repentance in Greek means a change of mind. The Hebrew counterpart means a change of action. There is a negative aspect to the gospel as well as a positive. We see them both in Mark 1.15, repent and believe. The repent is a turning from and the believe is a turning to, and both are involved in salvation. Jesus once said, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. There is a negative as well as a positive. This thing, only believe, only believe, is not New Testament gospel. It's repent and believe. Now, with this repentance to obtain the forgiveness of sin, Luke, the medical doctor, uses a medical term here. It means the remission of a sin. You might well see Mark 1.4. And so here we have a medical term, the, the alleviation, the correcting of the symptoms, the taking away of the problem. As it is written in the sermon book of the prophet Isaiah. Now we're going to have a quote from Isaiah 40, verses 3 and 4. The other gospels also quote this, but they leave out the last few verses. Luke adds verse 4 and 5 to this quote. The other gospels just quote 3. Now this is a rather unusual metaphor, so I want to talk about it a minute. In the, in the ancient world, when a dignitary, especially a king, was visiting, they would send runners ahead to pronounce his coming. And the towns would clean up. Much like when the president's visiting a small town, everybody paints up and cleans the street and paints the fire hydrants and paints the, you know, the storefronts. That's the idea here. So here we have a word that means the preparation of, of a royal one. Really, the Greek word parousia, or parousia, depending on what seminary you went to, uh, is the idea of a royal visit in a Greek term. This is in an Old Testament term. Notice it says, here is a voice of one shouting in the desert. This is what John, they said, who are you? Now, if you want a fuller discussion of who John is and the questions that were asked him by the religious leaders, you ought to see John 1, 19 through 25, where he claims to be a voice crying in the wilderness and quotes this. Now, Get the road ready for the Lord. Now, here's a good example. The Septuagint has our God, but they keep the word Lord here. The word Lord is used for Jesus, but it's an Old Testament title for God, and that shows the deity and preeminence of the Messiah. Okay? Now, it talks about ravines being filled up, paths being straight, crooked places becoming straight roads, rough roads being made smooth, and all mankind must see the salvation of God. Now, you might want to see chapter 2, verses 30 and 32. Here is the universalness of the gospel of Jesus. All mankind will see. Now the Hebrew text here, the MT, Masoretic text, has glory. But the Septuagint, which is the one quoted by all New Testament Christians, has the word salvation of God. So here's all mankind seeing them as salvation of God in the Messiah. A very universal element. Now, in verse 7, but he used to say in perfect tense, this was the kind of preaching he did over and over, to the crowds that continued to come out there and be baptized by him. Present participle, all Jerusalem was coming out to him, it says. Now, you brood of vipers, 
From Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, we learn that he said this to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a good example of the Old Testament ethical content connected with the preaching of the prophets. John said, this don't come out here for some act. You get your life straightened up first. Show me that you repented first. And here's a very ethical context of John's preaching. This is kind of an example sermon that he gave, okay? Boy, he called the leaders a brood of vipers, my goodness. Produce then fruit that is consistent with the repentance that you profess. You almost see Matthew 7, 13 through 23. Jesus said, by their fruit ye shall know them. That's what John's talking about. It's not how we talk religion, how we talk faith. It's how we live. Friends, deliver me from someone who talks like a faith life and lives a selfish life. Our walk and our talk need to jive. Now, notice where it says, Do not even begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our forefather. For I tell you, God can raise up descendants of Abraham from even out of these stones. Now, in Aramaic, there is a very close relationship between the word sons or descendants and the word stones. There's a play here. You might want to see Isaiah 51, 1 and 2. The Jews were very proud of their descent from the, the chosen people, the, the seeds of Abraham. And they thought they were right with God because they were Jews. I think a lot of people in America think they're right with God because they're an American, because their mother was a Christian, because they have a lot of churches in their community. That's the same kind of arrogant pride the Jews had that we sometimes have. Now, notice where it says, um, by the way, let's see, lost my place. Okay. Now, the axe is already lying at the roots of the trees. Every tree then that fails to bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Notice how he moved from their corporate trust and their nationality into individual responsibility. You want to see individual responsibility in the Old Testament? Y'all look at Leviticus, excuse me, Ezekiel 18. Jeremiah 31 is not half bad. <laughs> we move from corporate to individual. Now, notice what it mentions here. So the crowds were asking. They kept asking these kind of questions. What then ought we to do? They were saying, well, John, how should we live? What should we do? Very practical, oriented question. So he picks out a couple of examples out of many. First he says, he answered, the man who has two shirts must share with him who has none. Now this word for shirt is the inner garment used for warmth. Now it wasn't the more important outer garment that was used to sleep in, but it was that inner garment. We are to share what we have with the, those in need. Is tax collectors and the soldiers. And he doesn't tell them change jobs once they come to trust uh, in the God of Israel and prepare for the Messiah. He says, but do whatever you do in fairness. Now there's the key. It's not that tax collectors who were so hated by the Jews have to quit being tax collectors. They need to tax appropriately. It's not that soldiers need to quit being soldiers. They're so pushy. Now that's what he's saying. Now, Verse 15, so now the people were on their tiptoes in their expectations, and they were all arguing in their hearts about John, whether he himself was the Christ. There was some problem over the person of John in the early church. We find some people in Acts who didn't know anything but the gospel of John and his baptism. There were some later cults that developed around the person of John the Baptist. If you look at John 1, 19 through 25, you'll see that the Pharisees ask him, Are you the prophet? Are you the Christ? Are you the forerunner? And John denies all of these, though Jesus later says he is the forerunner. I think John was denying that he was the reincarnate Elijah, but Jesus was saying this is the man that was prophesied to prepare the way. So the person of John the Baptist is a very important, important subject. Now, notice where it says, And John expressly answered them all, I am baptizing you in water only, but there is coming uh, the one who is stronger than I am, whose shoestrings I am not fit to untie. Now that's, that's a cultural metaphor that has to be understood. The rabbis used to say that a disciple should do for his master what a slave does for his owner, except untie his shoes. Now John, knew, knowing that, said, that he wants to show his utter humility compared to the Messiah. And he says, I'm willing to do something that not even a slave would do, not even a devoted disciple would do. I'm ready to untie his shoes. And so it's a real metaphor of humility and abject lowliness in comparison to Jesus. And that's why he picked this. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. 
Now, there's been much, much discussion about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I've done a tape on that called, What is the Baptism of the Holy Spirit? And I think we must see that mainline Pentecostal theology, though they have some points to make, is using a biblical phrase, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but putting an unbiblical definition on that phrase. Now, I'm not saying there's not some truth in charismatic theology. I think there are some good points to that, but there are some problems. I hope you'll write for this tape, What is the Baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's in our new catalog, and I hope you'll send for that. To me, the Baptism of the Holy Spirit, if you look at 1 Corinthians 12, seems to be the initial inclusion of, of the person into Christ. It's a positional thing. We're baptized into him, locative of sphere. The Holy Spirit woos us, brings us to Christ, baptizes us into Christ, indwells us to bring Christ's likeness in our lives. And that's the idea here. Now, is the word fire, is it synonymous with the baptism of the Spirit? Is it sequential? Is it the same metaphor or a different metaphor? Well, God is often spoken of as fire, uh, but fire is also used for judgment. And I'm not 100% sure if we can explain completely what he meant here about baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. Maybe it meant repentance and faith, two different aspects, fire being repentance, the Holy Spirit being positive faith. I'm just not sure. I don't think we can lock it down and be real dogmatic on this subject. Now, verse 17. The willowing fork is in his hand, and he will clean out the threshing floor and store his wheat in the barn, and he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's saying that the great Messiah, the one who came to bring peace to the world and forgiveness of sin, is also going to come as the judge of all men. And those who know him, he's going to draw to himself, put in his barn is the metaphor here. Those who don't, are going to be burned. The idea of a fire indistinguishable, this is an eschatological passage. You might want to see Matthew 25, 46, where the same word eternal is used for eternal life and then for eternal fire. Oh, God help us. The great beauty of heaven, the great beauty of heaven is nothing to pair hardly with the great horror of hell. And the same word used for both. Words can't describe either one. Now, in verse 18. So with many and varied exhortations, John continued to proclaim the good news. Now, this is the word euangelon. We usually say gospel or good news. But I want you to remember that John is not a New Testament preacher. He is not preaching the gospel because Jesus has not come and lived and taught and died and rose again. The gospel is the finished work of Christ, who he is and what he did. John is the last Old Testament prophet, not the first New Testament preacher. Now notice if you would where it says, uh, but Herod, the governor, because he was repeatedly reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the wicked deeds that the Herod had done. Now, let's go back and see what we have here. Herod lived in Rome, Herod Antipas. While he was there, somehow he was able to seduce his brother's wife. Philip's wife was Herodias. And he took her, he divorced his own wife by uh, an, another wife he had. He just put her away. He wanted Herodias. Herodias' daughter Salome came with her. All this dance of the seven veils and John the Baptist's head is all caught up in this. Uh, the other accounts say that John lost his head because Herodotus planned it, because she was tired of him preaching against their incestuous relationship. Josephus tells us the reason Herod killed him is because he was afraid of a popular riot over John, which it is, we're just not sure, but this was a sordid deal, these uh, palace intrigues of that day. Now, notice where it mentions he added this on top to it all, that he put John in prison. Now this added, this is another medical term. It's obvious we're in Luke the doctor. This is a medical term that is only used in the New Testament in Luke and Acts. Doesn't that show us Luke the medical doctor writing this? Oh, I think it does. Now when it says put him in prison, we know from the writings of Josephus that this was a palace down by the Dead Sea called Machaerus is where John the Baptist was imprisoned. Now, now then, all the people who have been baptized and when Jesus had been baptized. Now, I want to stop there for a moment. Why was Jesus baptized? Now, think with me. If this is a baptism for repentance and the forgiveness of sins, why was Jesus baptized? Well, 
That's been the source of theological fights for, <laughs> for a long time. Let me give you the different theories if I could. Number one, he did it as an example for us to follow. Number two, he did it to identify with sinful man. Number three, he did it as a symbol of his redemptive task. And number four, it was his ordination experience and equipping for his ministry. This was a very, very important time for Jesus, his baptism. Now, notice the word Jesus is used in verse 21. In verse 22, we have the Holy Spirit coming down as a dove, and then we have a voice out of heaven, which is God the Father. Here again, we have the triune God. It is true the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible, but the triune God is in text after text dealing in man's redemption. I've done a tape on the Trinity where I go back to the Old Testament and give all the examples and go through all the passages in the New. I hope you'll send for our free catalog. Now, notice where it says, while he was still praying, the heavens opened up, and the Holy Spirit came down upon him in bodily form as a dove. Why a dove? Well, that's highly unusual. The dove had not been a real symbol of the Holy Spirit before this. Why the dove? Well, again, there are three possible backgrounds. Some say it's related to the Spirit brooding over the waters in Genesis. Now, that brooding is a mother bird term. Maybe the dove was connected. Some say it relates to Noah sending the dove out of the ark to see if there's land where, the, where they can settle and come out. Now, some say it refers to the rabbinical tradition that a dove was a symbol of the nation of Israel. We're not real sure. It's a rather unusual kind of way for the Holy Spirit to manifest himself. Now, notice where it says, a voice out of heaven. This is known in rabbinical theology as a bath coal. Since the last official Old Testament prophet was Malachi, around 350 B.C., there had been no official voice from God, no prophet, no speaker. And during this interbiblical period, the Jews developed this, that if God wanted to confirm a matter, he would speak out of heaven, or maybe thunder. Now, we have several examples of this, but you might want to see Psalms 2, 7, Isaiah 42, 1, bath coal. Notice what he said, "'You are my son, my beloved, in whom I am delighted.'" Now, who was he speaking for? I think he was speaking, number one, for Jesus. He was saying, I'm with you. I love you. I affirm you. I think Jesus was able to accomplish all that he did because he knew of the unswerving love of God for him and acceptance. Second, I think it was to the crowd for a witness to the person of Christ. Now, notice where it mentions here. You are... Uh, by the way, this deal, this Psalms 2 in Isaiah 42, that doesn't go with a, a voice from heaven. I, I made a mistake. That goes with this quote. This quote is made up from two places, a royal psalm, Psalms 2-7, and a suffering servant passage, Isaiah 42-1. God, Jesus is both the beloved royal son and the suffering servant, and these two scriptures relate to that quote. I'm sorry to confuse you there. Notice in verse 23 where it says, Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old when he began to work. This is the only place that we know that around 30 he began his work. That means he was born somewhere around 6 B.C. It's about A.D. 27. Now we know, the only way we know how many years of public ministry Jesus had is from the number of times in the Gospel of John the Passover is mentioned. We know for certain there are three Passovers mentioned, but I really believe that chapter 5 verse 1 is po probably another Passover with even maybe a fifth. So really, we don't know how many years of public ministry Jesus had, at least three, probably four, possibly five. We're just not certain. Now here we start the genealogy. It is unusual that Luke and Matthew, supposed to be the genealogy of Jesus, are both different. We, many have supposed that Matthew writing to Jews is Joseph's legal genealogy of which many people kept. But Luke who seems to get his information for this period of Jesus' life from Mary, and probably while Paul was in prison at Caesarea Philippi for two years, Luke took the time to travel around Palestine and talk to all these eyewitnesses. It seemed to be that Luke may be the genealogy of Mary. You notice that Luke is backwards, it starts backwards. Matthew starts at Abraham, the covenant people, written to Jews. But Luke, written, writing to Gentiles, starts with Adam and goes backwards. And so I think it's very unusual. These are so different. And yet, for the purposes involved, I believe they're both accurate, even though they're slightly different. Now, before every one, it says the son of, except for Joseph. There's a real difference with Joseph. It doesn't have that same formula. Notice mine says, as was supposed of Joseph. 
It's, it's Luke's way of saying that Joseph was not really the physical father, though to fulfill Jewish legal genealogies, Joseph had to be included here. If you'll go down to the very end, I think it's interesting to say, the son of Adam, the son of God. How different that is from Matthew's. Now, this genealogy is very different from Matthew 1, 1 through 17 is where it's talked about. This is a beautiful, uh, I think, transition from the ministry of the forerunner John to the ministry of the Messiah. There comes many problems in here, as we, the other Gospels record. Uh, John began to decrease in his popularity. Jesus began to increase. John was put in prison. Jesus left Judea and went back to Galilee. All the correspondence between John and Jesus, are you the Messiah? There, there was some question about whether John knew Jesus before the baptism. I think John knew him as his cousin, but did not know him as the Messiah. So you really got to put all the Gospels together to get a full picture of John the Baptist. Jesus once said of him, he is the greatest man ever born of a woman. Woo! What a passage! What a, what, a, what, a, uh, what a thing to say about a person. So John's an important figure. I often get tickled sometimes with Baptists. We try to trace our heritage back to John the Baptist. The little book, The Trail of Bloods, uh, example do that. I don't want to go back to John the Baptist. John the Baptist is not the first uh, preacher. He's an Old Testament man. And besides, the truth is that Baptists didn't really begin until England in the 15th and 16th century. So that's, that's, that's just a side, but uh, that's, that's the truth. I hope you'll compare these two genealogies. Um, they're different, and you'll have to explain why to yourself. I think it's Mary and Joseph that we're looking at. I think both of them were of divinic background. I've really enjoyed being with you.